who can get in front of the homeowner first and do the best job of that in 2023, I believe is the number one key to this year to being successful. Florida's in trouble insurance wise. Insurance companies are leaving every day. Last year we saw a lot of middle class, but we're not seeing that as much. It's more of, I really need a deal or I'm ready to spend a ton of money. It's one or the other. It's not really in the middle is like it used to be. They're gonna have to make changes to the insurance laws and they're gonna have to realize that there are roofs that can last longer than 20 years. Who do you blame? for insurance situation. Do you blame insurance companies and greed? Do you blame roofers, storm chasers, and lawyers? I've seen homes where the whole roof, you know, is missing, there's issues, and the, an insurance company doesn't want to cover it. I've seen homes with one shingle off and they'll cover it in a heartbeat. And then I also see roofers walking through neighborhoods causing the damage. Like, that's offensive to me as a roofer. Like, I don't like that image. All right, guys, today we're in Florida with two of my favorite local guys, Chris and Jason. And let me tell you this, these guys bring collaboration to another level. They've been feeding off each other for so many years. So we're going to have a conversation about what's happening in Florida in 2023. But first, if you don't have a friend in the roofing industry, find one, collaborate, because this makes us so much better. This guy is sitting here today while I'm interviewing Jason. And He's taking notes and he's like, I have to get my video up. Like, tell me first how you guys met and how you guys start working together. Well, I think he set an appointment to on Conklin to, to sign me up for Conklin. And uh, I showed up to a meeting with him. And our, at that time, I was on the other side of the street in our small building. And um, I just sat there watching Chris like articulate and, and just the energy that he had. And I'm like, man, I've got, I can do better. I mean, and, and then we did some jobs together and even after the jobs, I'm like, I can do better. This guy is on another league. And I took the information that he gave me and grew. And then I feel like from what he said, he's done the same. So, I mean, tell me about your experience and what you thought. Yeah, no, I liked it. That first time we were on the roof together and doing stuff and talking technicals and all that. I left from there as well, like, cause you were already doing a YouTube page and trying to help customers and get that message out. And I was like, man, I gotta do more of that. And again, today I'm here and I'm like, I definitely gotta do more of that. And, uh, but I just enjoy it. I mean, over the years, you and I have always shared ideas, talked. There's, there's a lot that happens in our state and in the rest of the country. And it's, it doesn't feel so lonely when you can talk to someone else who's kind of wearing the same shoes and, and going through it as well. But I think too, like Dimitri, Dimitri always talks about fitness too. And I, I was like, at that time when you came, I was probably 250 pounds. I was just not focused. And I just realized when someone came in and articulate and carried that energy, like I could tell that this guy like works on himself. I'm like, okay, I need to start there. And I like literally changed my life at that moment. So not just roofing, but my personal life also. And it's just look for those game changers and don't fear them actually like feed off each other and grow and, and be better is what I kind of got out of it. Love it. Let's talk about what's happening in 2023 in Florida. How did it change? So you both have pretty big companies. You've done a lot of business over the years, but this year, both of you are telling me it's very different. What is changing in Florida besides legal stuff and political climate? Yeah, so everything's changing. I mean, I can just real quick in the past, we really focused on materials and having it on hand because we all went through COVID and that's how we won. We, we literally doubled the size of our company, taking advantage of the situation, which is how can we buy in bulk and have it on site, like have it at our shop? That's how we got through the last couple of years. Now, 2023 is a totally different ball game. You can get the materials, that's not the issue. The issue is putting yourself in front of the homeowner and marketing to me is 2022, but also Google and all these companies are, are also looking to take advantage of you too. Like how can they get the most money out of you? And maybe you're not getting back what you need. So we're super focused on marketing and actually really pinpointing what works, what doesn't work, because we don't wanna spend all of our money on marketing, but who can get in front of the homeowner first and do the best job of that in 2023, I believe is the number one key to this year to being successful. 2024, you might see something totally different, but marketing might not be as big. But right now at the moment, all roofing companies are trying to market. They're spending way too much because it's not organic and they haven't done the work in the past. So doing the videos for the last five or seven years is really paying off, but marketing is the key to 2023, not spending too much, right? Like pinpointing the area and finding what works because you can blow a ton of money on marketing if you're not careful. Yeah, I, th I think our market's gonna change um, as interest rates have been rising. I think people are getting a little tighter with their money 
um, the big ticket items are gonna play a difference. I think this, this is the day and age you have to offer financing and, and have that option for customers. Do you see increase of finance jobs versus Yes, yes. 75% uh, probably increase for us in finance wow. jobs. And, and but we weren't offering it like we should have been before. Sure. So that's making a huge difference. I mean, Florida's in trouble insurance wise. Insurance companies are leaving every day. In our area, the high velocity hurricane zone down in South Florida, I think there's only three companies that'll insure someone if they live east of 95 and everyone's getting pushed to citizens, which is a state run fund who's, let's face it, they got a lot higher premiums. So in an effort to attract insurance companies back to the state, we're doing things and helping with the secondary water barriers and things we never did in the roofs before. The state came out with $100 million for a grant that every homeowner can get up to $10,000 if they're doing these hurricane strengthening um, techniques to the roof. And they're really, really trying to get everyone back. The whole, if your roof's 20 years old, you gotta replace it that insurance companies are doing. I mean. That's got to change too. I mean, we can put on a 40, 50 year metal roof and to tell them they got to replace it in 20 years is absurd. So I think um, the NRCA and some of those organizations are starting to help and they're trying to get in front of, you know, legislation and, and get these changes made. What else is changing? Yeah, so I, I feel like we're seeing a big difference between low class and high class and the middle class is kind of going away. So in the past, you know, people had money to spend on the roofs. We weren't doing as much financing. Now you have more of the low end. It's really tight. And then all of a sudden you have this extreme where homeowners are willing to pay whatever it takes to put a real expensive metal roof system on and they don't care about the price. Right. So we're seeing both of those avenues but financing has been huge. So we're trying to appeal to both of those. So we're doing a ton of videos on metal to kind of appeal to that homeowner, but then we use ugly roof, roof cleaning, stuff like that to appeal to the homeowner that's on a budget. And then we can get those guys signed up on financing and, and get a roof on if that's what they need. But we're seeing the middle class kind of diminish. We're not seeing, like last year we saw a lot of middle class, but we're not seeing that as much. It's more of, I really need a deal or I'm ready to spend a ton of money. It's one or the other. It's not really in the middle as like it used to be. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, people don't want a roof, they need a roof. Right. It's not like a kitchen or adding a pool, you know, so it's something they have to have. So the financing is a big plus. Do you see increase in the repairs? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, repairs is a massive business for us. Um, we're working our way to 30 techs at the moment, like a 27, 28 right now. We're adding more. Um, the problem with roofing is getting through the season when there's no rain with your repair techs. So if you've got 30 repair techs and it's not raining, that's a problem. So what we manage to do is we put those guys in smaller jobs in those seasons. And then when the rainy season starts, they're back to doing repairs, but repairs lead to re-roofs. They lead to return customers that don't even get a second estimate because you've already satisfied them in the past. So sure. yeah, repairs are a massive part of that business. And some of these homeowners don't have the money for a re-roof and they only need a repair. And that's what I meant. So more people probably want to repair mm -hmm. and wait what, what about cleaning? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're repairing and kicking the can down the road. Yeah. Um, in our area, we got HOAs that kind of make them clean the roof every year. So it's a big plus for us. It's not, once again, it's not a want. It's something they have to do. If they don't do it, they're going to get fined by their HOA. So roof cleaning is a big business. So you can take repair guys, put them in that. Over the years, we've signed up a lot of annual maintenance for commercial roofs, which is always cleaning, caulking, topping off pitch pans, easy stuff and then building those relationships. So when it's time for them to re-roof that, we already got the relationship there. So, and it does help keep repair guys busy. Yeah, and I agree with him. Maintenance is becoming a bigger, bigger deal. I know even insurance companies are stepping up saying they want the maintenance. And then the key to that is they actually really want the documents that show where the roof condition is. So if there is a storm, they can prove whether it's new or not, like existing. Yep. So I think um, appealing to that, like this is all about insurance at this point. They're the ones making you replace your roof. And so, for us, if we can extend that, that's what we found. Like there's a lot of roofs, like he's saying, that are perfectly good. They don't need to be replaced. And so we're, we're able to provide solutions for those homeowners. So every aspect we have a solution for, where most roofing companies, they're just here to sell you a re-roof. Yep. What about uh, DeSantis labor changes? Like, mm -hmm. do you feel effect of it yet? So we were prepared for it. Um, I feel like, the state is, is going to have a massive effect to it. Um, we already have all of our employees on board. And um, then that, so it doesn't affect you. If they're right. already an existing employee, they don't look back. It's only on new, new hires. Year. Yeah, so that's the key. I think DeSantis did that on purpose. He's a very smart man. Um, it seems like it was a bad idea, but I think if you read through it, 
there's some things in there where there's some protections and he thought it through. Um, I don't think it's good for the state, to be honest with you. I, th I think we need to slow down people coming in. I get that. I'm 100% on that. But some, some of the hardest working people I've ever in my life, like th the American citizens aren't going to do the job. It's just not going to happen. They're not. They don't want to do it. It's funny because we have so many um, comments about we did a story. Hold on. I'm going to read some comments really quick because that's hilarious what people say but to answer your question yes i did see it i heard a lot of guys there's a lot of people that did leave our state um just in fear of it and not understanding it you know um it's not as bad like jason said the way they structured it if you read through it it really is to, to prevent new people from coming in illegally here's the key to that though most businesses when they first started talking about it they panicked Yep. And now they're, they're, they're in distress. They don't have, and they didn't actually take the time to understand it. And I think that's what the key is. Absolutely. So for guys like us is like, how do we capitalize in this mo moment? Like, what do we do to yep. make us better? So check this out. This video has, um, in 28 days, 258,000 views, mm -hmm. but I want to read some of the comments because there are just, so here's what people say. Immigrants think American won't do hard labor. Clearly, these people don't know what they are saying. I'm American from Mexican parents, and the majority of construction men I work with are white men. Where does he live? Yeah, I'm not sure where he lives at, <laughs> but I can tell you this. Here's what I know. If I wasn't involved every day, I mean, we even have Spanish, Colombian, all kinds of people. Like, some of the Colombian guys that work for us actually ha are engineers. Like, but they're some of the hardest working people we've ever seen. But what I can tell you is I probably wouldn't have the same thought process if I wasn't in roofing. So I thank God every day that I get to work with these guys and these people because I understand it much better than somebody that doesn't. So we get homeowners all the time and says like, hey, I don't I don't appreciate guys here that can't can't speak English. And and it really bothers me because it's it wait till they're done. And when they're done with the job, they have so much respect for them afterwards. But beforehand, they don't get it. And I wouldn't have got it neither. So I'm very happy that I got a chance to work with them. Just got to tell those people, guys. hey, they speak roofing. That's all you need to worry about. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, you want, here's the key. You want a really good job, really clean, neat. You know, like these guys are good. That's what matters in the end is how do we provide that for you as a homeowner. Get to know these guys. It'll change your life. And Because, listen, these guys are all about family. They get together, they all eat lunch together. And we actually grow from that personally, like seeing how they act. Like they can be mad at each other, but that night they're going home to eat all together. Like it's, we all need to learn from them to be honest with you. 100%. Yep, I agree. Oh, hard topics. What, what other challenges do you have? What, what you, oh, here's what I wanna know, materials. What's new, exciting materials that you see, Ethan, new changes? I'm, I'm gravitating towards these butyl underlayments now instead of an asphalt underlayment because in our market, when we put on a tile roof, the tile will last 50 years and it's usually fine and we're tearing these roofs off. It's because the underlayment is, it's become dry, brittle and crack, cracked. So now these new underlayment warranties will match the roof covering warranty. So for the first time ever, we're going to be able to give a true 50 year warranty on a tile roof. Now, how's that going to affect us with the insurance companies at that 20 year? That's why I said they're going to have to make changes to the insurance laws and they're going to have to realize that there are roofs that can last longer than 20 years. So I think that's going to all play out in the next couple of years. And that's going to be part of what's going to there's going to be insurance reform, I believe, in our state. It, it just it has to change for that reason. You know, there's there's no reason why, you know, at 20 years, if the roof is fine, why they should be forced to replace it and spend that kind of money. All right, here's my question to the audience and to you guys. Everybody answer, please go in the comments. I'll, I read my comments and I do uh, research and I document it. Here's what I wanna know. Who do you blame for insurance situation? You guys two local roofers. Do you blame insurance companies and greed? Do you blame roofers, storm chasers and lawyers? Or how do we get to what we got? Or do you blame the weather and conditions and storms? I blame both. I think everybody has, I, mean, I don't want to take the middle road, but it's to me, it's really what happens is I've seen homes where the whole roof, you know, is missing, there's issues and the, an insurance company doesn't want to cover it. I've seen homes with one shingle off and they'll cover it in a heartbeat. So, and then I also see roofers walking through neighborhoods causing the damage. Like that's offensive to me as a roofer. Like I don't like that image. It is, you're actually seeing really good roofing companies go out of business because they're not willing to do that. Like, and so I, cause for instance, for me, there's a house that I went to 
And I walked it, there was no missing shingles on the house. There was no damage, there was no issues. And I came back two weeks later and got on the neighbor's house. I look over on that house and they're missing 50 shingles. And I'm like, and there's a roofer sign in the, in the yard. And then that homeowner comes to me and says, hey, you did me a disservice. You didn't find the storm damage. And I'm like, because those shingles were there when I was there. So now the homeowner doesn't like me, but I did the right thing. So I think the roofers and the insurance companies are both to blame. Both take advantage of the homeowner at some point. There's really good, respectable roofers out there. And that's what I appreciate about Roofing Insights. They're putting those guys up front. And I think that's made a big impact on the industry and kind of putting the guys back behind that that aren't really, you know, the guys that are integrity based and doing the right thing. But I, I blame both. Yeah, I have to agree. I had to say both. I've been through major, major storms since I've been in this state. And there's been times where clearly the roof was damaged and the insurance company flat out denied. So these people were forced to have to either get a public adjuster or attorneys and go after the insurance company. I've always noticed in during storms, you can see at a certain level when these companies hit their reinsurance levels, then all of a sudden they loosen up. Okay, we're gonna pay for the roof, we're gonna pay for the roof. But until they get to that point, they're fighting, fighting, fighting. And some of these people genuinely needed new roofs. I mean, it was clearly storm damage and they denied them. So they kind of created that themselves, I think. And now I think the attorneys and all that, I think it's overboard, you know? Everyone's just suing the insurance company right away every time now, but it's kind of, I kind of feel like they created that and forced that issue. I totally agree. And now it's, it's, it's a mess. Yeah, I think the insurance, uh, you know, a lot of times the 90% of homeowners will move away from the claim after they keep denying it, keep denying it. And so roofers had to get aggressive to fix that. So the insurance can cause some of these problems themselves. Even some of the new laws where they're saying, hey, you have to re replace your roof every 15 years. What did that cause? That caused roofers to do inspections and then now all of a sudden you got claims. So like the insurance is trying to find a way out of all this and sometimes they actually create more problems in the end. But honestly, I blame both. I think the insurance company has a lot of blame too. Yeah, I mean, when, they, when that law came out, they said, as long as you get a licensed roofer to write you a letter that the roof has five years of useful life left, the DeSantis said they cannot drop you. They have to reinsure you. So they all went and rewrote their policies and they said, okay, but it's got to have a secondary water bear, knowing none of these roofs have that because we weren't doing that 15 years ago. So now they're going out and say, oh, well, you don't have the secondary water bear. So sorry, you got to replace it anyways. So it's, it's a game. It's always been a game, you know, and we, we always try to represent the homeowner. You know, I've always tried to be honorable and gone in there like, I, no, I do not believe you have storm damage. You don't have a claim here, but if they do, yeah, I think they should. And if the insurance company denies it, then yeah, you gotta get the attorney. You gotta do what's right. It's, I think they created their own mess. And even as you saw these laws changed recently, they changed in the way they wrote their policies. <laughs> you have a lot of public adjusters in Florida, what's the reputation they have? Do they contribute to, to the issues? Yeah, so, so I see that too, uh, same thing, right down the middle, like some do, some are all part of, of finding damage, like a big part of it, and some aren't, some are really looking for it, but we're not, seeing, we're not seeing the big use of those guys anymore, the public adjusters as much, it's more straight to the lawyers is what we yeah. see. Yeah, because the public adjuster, even the good, good ones that can win or go fight the claim, if they lose, then it goes to the attorney anyways. So a lot of these guys just stopped even trying to do it themselves. They get signed up, they're a middleman, and it goes straight to the attorney. Straight to the attorney, yep. And I think, like you said, the insurance has created this. They uh, have. And they have the money to spend to be a couple steps ahead of us. Um, they've also, I mean, they. I feel like DeSantis is kind of geared towards them. They got them kind of leveraged. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not good for the homeowner. It's political. Yeah, and so, I mean, I think, I think there's a lot to blame to go around, but um, on both sides. Do you feel like Roofer is going you know, way too hard to find the damage these days. You know, like um, the accusations are that a lot of roofers are crisping shingles. And uh, I, I honestly feel like some of these problems are actually manufactured defects. They're not putting the same energy hmm. in building products anymore. So they're not, they're not sticking like they should. And so then that becomes storm damage. But to me, I see a lot of the manufacturers not backing their products, creating all kinds of ways to get out of it and relying on storm chasing to get rid of their problems. To me, a lot of those problems like zippering, a lot of times it's a manufacturer issue. Yeah, bro bro broken seals. And that's a great point because we have shingles that has lifetime wind warranties, mm -hmm. 130 mile wind warranties, and now 60, 70 mile wind destroys it. Why? insurance does not go after manufacturers. Well, sometimes too, that could be a lack of ventilation, thermal, thermal shock to the underlayments from a hot attic, the hot roof. 
So there's other variables that come into play now, but I agree with you. Um, we know in our area, you know, if we're putting down tile and we permit for a large paddy foam, and it happens all the time, there'll be a roofer that'll install just a little bit of foam. We know now that the insurance carriers can go back and look and say it wasn't installed the way it was permitted and they can deny the claim. And then the homeowner has to go after the roofer. Right, so the key to that is insurance will go after the roofer. Right. They're not going after the manufacturer. The reason being is those warranties are written in a way where they don't have to do anything to regards of the warranty. And so what's gonna happen is the roofer's gonna pay the price. Even like on that case, the roofer probably should because he didn't do it right. Yep. But the warranties are actually written too. This is another key. Like in the warranties, they can go and start met. So I was on a roof the other day where I had a holes in the roof from the manufacturer. It was a defect, easy, right? They come out there and they're picking the shingle up, measuring how far away the nails are. There's no problem with the shingle blowing off the roof. Right. There's no problem there, but they don't care about those. They all do holes. that. So in their warranties, it covers things like that. It says, well, you know, they don't have to cover if it was installed improperly. And, and that's how you drop that manufacturer. Right. But, there, but insurance isn't going to go after the manufacturer because they know they don't have a leg to stand on. So what's going to happen next? They're coming after the roofer. And guess what? Roofers can't afford that. That's not the way it's going to work. I mean, it won't work. Yep. I, I know as far as for the storms now, and you can uh, verify this Eagle View now, this new technology have in the, in the plane, they got contracts now, I believe, after a storm, those planes within 48 hours are flying over and they can document damage now. They even got the new technology, they can zoom in and tell you if the roof's got algae on it. So guys that do manufacture damage, this and that, they're gonna get caught and they're, they're gonna get in trouble for it. So hopefully that helps a little with the insurance crisis, but that, that's gonna all change now with the new technology out there and what they can do. Agreed. I wanna finish on a note that we started. We started with a collaboration between two roofers. I have a heartbroken message here. Someone just sent it to me on Tuesday. Uh, I'm gonna read this and I want you guys to give advice to this guy. I get a lot of these, by the way. Hey brother, I'm shooting my shot on this one. Short story, I've been working with a company that have operated with integrity for eight years. and the last two years, things have dramatically changed and ended with the owner filing for bankruptcy. Many people, both employees and customers have been hurt a ton through this process and through the changes. I worked my way up from a sales rep to a sales manager in less than four years. All have all have been terminated a few weeks ago. I have made the decision to go off and start my own roofing company with the desire to build something great that serves people well. I watch a ton of your content and really grateful as it served me well. I started on a startup business school and working through the content and being helpful. What I'm shooting my shot on is asking for a connection. I'm a combat veteran and I know how to overcome obstacles and persevere through challenges. I really need some sort of mentorship from someone who knows in the industry. Uh, I know you know there are a lot of normal challenges one deals with starting a company, but I'm dealing with the exasperated issues due to the fallout of this other company that has been deeply rooted in the community the past seven years. It's been a roller coaster ride for the past couple of weeks, wrestling to keep balanced in decision making along with the action taken. It's hard to process and talk to people here logically because of their involvement. I'll do what needs to be done to make this successful, but I'm lacking in encouraging wisdom and sound direction. Not sure if you're aware of anyone who's been through something similar, but it would be a major blessing to have some sort of support. Thanks for all the minimum and reading this. And I, I texted him, I said, text me your number. I have his number. I would like to connect with you too, if that would be okay. But long story short, like well, I started a business, I worked for a company for two years and the boss filed bankruptcy, it was devastating to me. And I came home, told my wife, I'll never work for anyone else. I never did. Started my flooring company at the time that I sold later and then roofing business. But what advice would you give something like that? Eight years in a business folding, you can see the pain there. Yeah, I what? think we, you did video on this the other week. These companies become very large and they can actually go on very fast. Like and we're growing and we can see that. that I can see that more realistic than ever. Um, but what I would say for him is go out and start that small business and put that integrity to use and put that combat vet to use. Like let people know tell who the you story. are. Tell your story. But go out and tell a story on, get your phone out and tell a story. Hey, I'm a combat vet. This is what I used to do. Um, like talk about your, your struggles, like become real to the community, become your own person. 
And so that people are going to reach out to you for a roof because you don't have to go out and say like, I'm the best roofer or I offer this great financing. Just tell your yeah. story, get it out there because right away I can tell that this guy's probably integrity based. And that's really what someone's looking for when they yeah. want to put a roof on. I, <clears throat> I agree. Stay small. It'll change and you'll have to adapt with the changes because at each level, um, I mean, when I was younger, I was probably chasing revenue. You know, and now all I care about is the bottom line. <laughs> you know, I don't care what I do. I care about the bottom line. And it's, and I had mentorships that helped me retrain the way I think and this and that. And I always wanted to be bigger, bigger, bigger. And, you know, I had to change my mentality. No, I need to be healthier, 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 you know, at the bottom level. And, and when you're new, like it sounds like he's going to be, don't chase the revenue, chase the systems, the processes, get that foundation built and laid down. And, you know, I think when I started, I, you know, I was always this as a roofer and I just never felt like I could break out. You know, now with good mentorship, I feel like I've always been doing this and steadily, steadily, steadily doing it the right and the healthy way. But it's long term. It, like it, you're saying. It's very long term. And, and at one point, maybe he will get bigger or maybe he shouldn't. I mean, you got to let the situation, you know, work itself out. But yeah, he's absolutely right to grab, grab a mentorship and figure it out and get the foundation built. And, but you know, that's the, the most guys, that's the one thing I don't, who cares about revenue? I, I, <laughs> I care this, about profit. I have this question for you because Igor, my video guy, just yesterday were asking me, what are they doing? How, how do you lose money doing like 5 million a year? He just couldn't comprehend it. Like what, what goes on? Can you explain how roofing business can lose money doing millions a year and why all these companies go, like you've been in business, like you know what it feels and means, like you know what led, led to it. Explain mm -hmm. to someone who starts the business, mm -hmm. how do $10 million business don't have million dollars to pay ABC supply? Uh, it starts at, you know, expenses that can get out of hand and you start to operate at bigger numbers. But like even in your personal finances, those small little things, as a big business, you need all of these tools to make it run. And they start out small and then they just, you keep getting more and more before you know it, you have all these expenses. And not only that, like they might be, say that expense is 5,000 and then it increases to 8,000. You're, you're losing touch with that. Like you don't see those expenses every day. And then like before when I would spend a thousand dollars, that was a big deal. Now I'll throw $20,000 and I start to lose that sense of what that really means. And I think when you become big, you start to lose it out your back door of, the, of your business. Not really focused on that. You're focused on feeding. How do I get the work for these focused guys? On sales. You're focused on sales. And when you start focusing so much on that, do sales fix back. everything? No, they don't <laughs> fix everything. I think it, 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 it's a, it's a moment that it can fix. Like it feels good for a moment, but it's something you're always chasing. It, it buys you more time right. to That's figure it, it out and fix it. But it doesn't, it doesn't actually fix it. It it's just like, buys it's you like time. It's like gasoline in the fire. Right? Yeah. But you have more people making decisions for you also. Like some of those things, I'm not making that actual decision like I used to in the past. And that person that works for you sees all this money coming in. Oh, yeah, we can afford that. Oh, yeah, we need that. And it just grows from there and it's quick. Just like Yeah, that. and I think there's levels. Like one to five million, the business can run pretty much a certain way. Once you get over that five million to the 10, 15 million, it changes. And you, you don't really want to be an $8 million company and be in the middle because now you're paying what the $15 million has to and you're, it affects your bottom line. So you either need to, at that point, either do I want to scale it down or, or do I want to go all in? And, and you really do. There's those in-between stages of growth and some guys shouldn't make it to that next level. You know, it, sometimes it's not worth it or understand where you're at and what you're building and where you need to go. But, you know, that's why I say, don't just chase the revenue. You know, you got to look at everything on the back end too. Like Jason said, you know, operations, production, all that stuff is just as important as sales. And a lot of guys will lose control of that. They start losing their quality control when they get bigger. And, and it just, you know, bigger is not always better, you know, and I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> Yeah, there's that middle point where you'll reach this one point, like maybe between eight and 10, and you really don't have the money for the managers that you need. And so like it becomes very stressful. But then when you start to get to the 20 to the 30, now you can put a little bit more process. One of the number one things I see, everybody talks about processes and how important that is. But at some point you can have too much processes when you're a smaller company that actually cost you a ton of money. Like you could have meetings all the time and you have all these people sitting in that meeting, it's costing you money. So there's a time and a place for that. I believe that you want processes, but I've seen so many new companies with so many processes that they're not actually 
out working. You know what I mean? Like you've got to get that turned in first and then get some of those processes built over time. Like I recently have invested a ton of money into creating new processes and procedures and mapping it all out at a $30 million company. You know, like, so I think sometimes you get ahead of yourself and you start building all those processes too soon. You need to get the ball rolling, but totally right. There's like that mark, you know, eight to 10, very difficult. Well, that's why we keep saying long-term, long-term. Mm -hmm. Like for me, it took 12 years to get to the point that I'm at. And every day was tough. I mean, I was working seven days a week, you know, like every day we were working, but Nobody knows that now, you know, at your company, they're like, oh, I saw, I saw you off at four the other day. Like, yeah, it's, they weren't here, you know, at the 10 years During ago. the building stages. Yeah. 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 Last question. Solar. I know you dump solar. You used to do solar. You don't do solar anymore. I think you're referring to solar now. Where are you with solar? So for me, solar, I want to make sure that I give the homeowner a really good value. Uh, and I think, um, it takes a really good focus on solar to do that. You know, it's it's the wild west in solar. Like people are left paying all this money, maybe not getting what they thought they were getting. I don't want to be involved in that. And, and I also know that I have limitations as a per like what I can handle. And right now, like roofing takes everything I have. So solar's it's just not my game at the moment. And because I don't feel like I could give the homeowner something great. Yeah, I just felt like the margins weren't there. Couldn't make the same margins I can make in roofing. There's a lot more service calls. An amp goes out or a panel's out. They're calling you for all the little technical things. So there is a lot of service calls after. And when you got to factor that into the profit of it too, all these callbacks and stuff that you have to go through, to me, the margins just weren't there. I think solar is more of a volume game and these bigger companies like Power and stuff like that who can make lower margins because they're, they're doing that much more volume and they've made it very easy just to refer it to them now and they handle it and they handle the headaches. I, just, I decided to, to get out of solar for that reason. Um, when the interest rates really spiked, it didn't make sense to me anymore to finance solar because we were trying to offset the electric bill and now with where financing is, it, it financially didn't quite make as much sense. I think when they come back down, I might revisit it. I might look at it again. But, you know, I just seeing all the callbacks from solar, from just stuff that's out of our control even, you know, even from the net meter from the power company, someone doesn't know how to read it. It made the phone ring a lot more in just the short time that we did it. And I was like, ooh, if this is what it's going to be like, I don't want to grow solar and have it bigger. Well, absolutely agree. Comment below what you think. Give it a like for Jason and Chris. I'll see you in the next one.